Great to see you. We'll give it just uh, another 30 seconds before we get started. I'm going to uh, do a little uh, digital education first. Please, everybody, mute your microphone. Um, so uh, we just hear the speakers. And if you um, want to see the screen differently, there's a little um, possibility in the top right corner where you can push view and then you can kind of see uh, things, either the slides bigger or the speaker in another way or see the participants and so on. All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first of three digital webinars. I am super excited about starting out today, um, especially because we are in a phase where digital, um, I'm get, just one more note, please everybody mute your microphones, that would be really great. Um, but we are in a state of digitalization moving faster and faster and faster. And one downside to that is that in the design industry, we still have a big need, at least we assume we still have a big need to touch our product, to see them and feel them. We also live in an industry where we're fragmented into a lot of different stakeholders. We have um, brands, but the brands are dependent on their suppliers and, and all the others uh, producing the, uh, the product. But also going forward, we need to collaborate with retailers in a lot of different industries and, and we don't specifically own them so we can't tell them exactly what to do. And on the last note, um, a lot of the design industries, especially in the furniture industry, they are collaborating in a contract market where the ones that are paying for the products are not necessarily the ones deciding that it's these products we're gonna work with. So the digital maturity and the digital tools are just growing extremely fast and the pace is even worse. But our products, our mindsets, our strategy needs to understand how do we work with this being a design industry and being a design brand. That's why I'm so excited about this project that you're going to listen in on. My name is Heidi and I'm from the lifestyle Hi. industry. And we work with these research and development products, projects, and we are just a facilitator for today, but we are gonna show and invite you uh, to listen in to a lot of different cool people that are gonna work on a project that all of you are welcome to participate in. More on that later. For now, I'm gonna welcome uh, Stefan from CBS who is the project manager for this project that you guys can be part of. And uh, during today, I hope you get a lot of inspiration. And if you find that you have more questions than answers by the end, you will definitely be the one that should sign up to be part of this project. So for now, my name is Heidi. And if you have any questions, let us know. But uh, today you will meet Via Design, CBS, and Aarhus University. So welcome, Stefan. If you want to unmute your microphone and say hi. So thanks so much, Heidi, uh, and uh, hi to everyone. Um, as, as Heidi said, I'm Stefan, Stefan Henningsson. I'm, I'm a professor at Copenhagen Business School, um, I mean, appropriately in the Department of Digitalization. So I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very focused on digital technology and how they change what is possible. But uh, in this particular area, we work with the lifestyle design, the fashion, the furniture, the I mean, apparel. Um, anyway, this is of course not, this is an area where probably you are more into the details than, than many of us. So I see this as sort of, sort of a collaborative co-creation of knowledge where we try to bring in and people from different capacities. Um, whereas I come from a background then with the organizational use and how they can transform organizations by using it. And this is, I guess we are collective as a group. We are sort of in a, on a mission here because over the last year or so, I, I was being interviewed by media. I mean, the, the used newspapers and TV and so on. I guess, oh, this has meant such a dramatic change and, and transformation uh, on the COVID with digital. And, uh, and, and 
And I kind of, yeah, a bit, right? So we're using Teams for seminars, right? Um, we all know, we're all meeting. But what we've really been missing, I think, in the last year or two years is to fundamentally unlock the, the, the capacities of digital technology to do things differently, not just doing exactly the same thing as what we're doing, but, but over a Teams meeting or Zoom meeting. So, so this is our mission. Um, we've seen a lot of adoptions, and many of you have started to play around and you used web shops, et cetera. Um, but we are really I mean, interested here to, okay, what is cooking? Map what's brewing in this space. And then together with you explore, how do we actually unlock this capacity to take it for the next level? How can this now allow us to do things differently? And, uh, and even if we think that I mean, the industries you work with are different in many regards, as I said, to, to many other contexts, there are something that's setting you out, um, um, oh, partly because of what you produce, but partly also how, how this is organized. So we have found three focus areas um, which, based on our experiences, really are um, core to explaining how, what is going on and how to move forward. And today we're going to look into one of them more specifically, and I will stop speaking in, a, in just a second. Um, but the, the first one is really how to introduce digital touch points. Now you're interacting with your customers across a different set of channels. What does that mean for customer journeys and, and so on? Then in a different track, in a different sort of point of attack, we look at this specific issue that if I'm buying designer goods and buy, designer, designer furniture and fashion clothes, et cetera, I normally need to touch it, I need to feel it, I need to smell it. And how do we cope with that specific aspect? And then in the last seminar, uh, last point of attack, we take I mean, the specific uniqueness of the structures of industry and the B2B side of it, where we all interact with designers, producers, resellers, specifiers in the contract markets in a com complex ecosystem. And this is something else than just opening a web shop and selling stuff. And how do we actually digitize that aspect of it? So these are our, our sort of three points of attack. And together with you, we hope that we can do map what is brewing in Denmark and internationally, but also ex eventually explore how to take this to the next level. And that's why it's an only, not only research looking back, but also development looking forward. So over to you, Rune. Yep. Thank you very much, both Heidi and Stefan. Um, so my name is, um, is Rune, and I'm head of a research and development program at Via University College. Uh, and I'm uh, part of this track one in this uh, very exciting and fascinating project that Heidi and Stefan just uh, uh, described. Obviously, um, I should say that being part of it, but really what's, uh, what we intend to do is here that we want to embark on a journey. So we want to take the journey metaphor literally to be address journeys, customer journeys, but we want equally to be on a journey with you collaborating on documenting best practices together, as well as envisioning next practices. So this track one webinar is really about teasing you to sign up in as a case company or to follow us in our work. So it's not really at this point about concrete solutions and tricks of the trade, but we are quite certain that we together in the process will come to that uh, together. This is kind of our intention here. So we want to you know, zoom in on and problematize current practices in order to move forward to next practices. This is basically um, our, our starting point here. So digitalization, digital transformation, as Heidi talked about, is really about lots of stuff. It's obviously about digital touch points. It's about replacing or renewing foundational technology platforms. If we look into, for instance, information systems research, it's about how can we take up and simulate and escalate our digital infrastructures. And at other points, it's about moving into, let's say just, just a social media platform, which is perhaps easy, but if we want to change our whole intelligence foundation, that's a whole different stories, for instance. So this is really not just a question of technology, it is equally about culture and vision and how you work with this. So 
do we need or do we use technology and digital touch point to have a product focus? Is it a customer focus? Is it a journey focus? Or is it perhaps a focus on the context of it all? This is really what we want to inspire you uh, towards. And really also what this uh, illustration from uh, Pixar Animation and Walt Disney, the, the, the great up uh, movie that I guess you all know about Carl Fredrickson and uh, he, the boy Russell that takes off on a, an extreme journey in which, as we see it, they go into multi-directional uh, uh, yeah, directions throughout the journey. They're, they they have really become a moving target in that sense. And it's really about how can we manage the unexpected here of, of this journey. So we plan up what Carl did with his wife Ellie to go on to this journey, but then all of a sudden all the stuff of things happened and he didn't go to, on to the journey. And when he launched the journey, what happens then? This is really what we also want to address here this multi-directional and moving target aspect of it. In lots of different consultancies like Impact Omnichannel Index here from 2020 and McKinsey and others, um, actors have made some brilliant work here in terms of mapping the digital customer journey and so on. We have the, the classic phases here with awareness, evaluation, purchase, service, and and advocacy or loyalty or what, what we should call it. This is of course something that we need to, to stretch out in a linear phase model in order to allocate resources, in order to make decisions as we go along. But I think most of you also know that in reality, it's not that linear uh, as such. So, so really it's perhaps much more uh, this drawing that is, um, is it, is what's at, at, at play here. So really also this track is about tapping into the dilemma of navigating this entanglements of touch point of digital online and install real world nature that goes on here. We might have the different phases here of the customer journey before, during, after as well, but we might also have lots of other question marks here that, that entangles here. So this is really also what we want to address here. And in all of this, we have short-term gain versus long-term pain and so on, customer lifetime value, and how can we you know, nurture the customers that we have, the existing one, while at the same time exploring uh, new ones. This is extremely difficult. And as you all know, and in this HPR interview, uh, the director of the Boston Consulting Group has um, actually quite says it really good here in 1955 fortune 500 companies were faced with demands often that did not contradict today this number has just escalated uh, exponentially so presence of multiple actors with many competing concerns this gap is at the same time catalyzed by the presence of all these measurement systems you work with different kpis customers have a different opinion of those kpis we have a productivity dilemma, as we call it, within research in terms of we want to exploit what we already do, be better at it, but at the same time also explore new stuff. This is basically a paradox that you're facing here. On the one side, trying to innovate and explore, but we also know that when we innovate, we also become less e effective because we need to trial and error and so on. We have speed and reliability. We want Customers want us to live, deliver even faster on the same day, but we should by all means also be reliable. That's usually also a paradox. Online presence versus in-store presence, sell high quality products to low prices and so on. And in all of this, of course, the different grand challenges that also Heidi uh, addressed, green transitioning into sustainability, digital skills gap, COVID-19, in addition, as Moons will talk about in a minute, cultural political movements as well also is something we need to address into. So we all need a mirror, mirror on the wall that can tell us who our customer is and so on. But what actually tends to be the case is that we end up as the researchers in this uh, Gary Larson drawing, looking at ourselves in a one-way mirror. 
So we forecast, we do lots of forecasting on who the customer is, how can we best possible way reach them in order to position ourselves. But this is really also about how do we look at and treat data, right? So what is our intelligence focus? And this track is basically, or this project is also about collaborating on how to treat and look at data. Um, so what do we plan to do? This is a, a quite a long quote, and I think time is against me, but basically we want to be in this track, the fourth umpire here that says, you call the, the balls and strike nothing until the lines have been drawn in the sand, the rules of the great game agreed upon, the spectators in place, the sponsors in sight. So we need to move away from a narrow-sided focus on balls and strikes, like in the Gary Larson picture, and then look at all the surrounding context that is at play here. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the audience, the buyers, the customers, the, the value chains, and so on. So this is actually calling for flank movement is our argument here. It could be a shift from customer to the constituent elements that make customers exist at all. Why talk about con consumer behavior? Why not consuming behavior and the practices, the technologies and the devices and mechanisms that constitute the customer? And Rune, you will uh, get your uh, final uh, quote here and then yep. uh, Moons will uh, continue the story. That's uh, great. So my, my, my final note would be that this calls for a presence, uh, the presence of multiple worlds. We need to look into hybridity, moving in and out in different domains. And very finally, this is actually our, our framework that we want to uh, address together with you. So we have your brand and look into what value experiences and sense making does it provide at a time T relative to some customers in some circumstances that are complex and dynamic, really. Very shortly, and uh, I hope it provided lots of questions that we can address in, uh, in our... Um, I'm in a great right. uh, opening line, Mune, and uh, a great teaser, and the chat is open. So if this raised any questions or with friction, shoot it in the chat. And Rune is uh, part of the seminar all morning. Thank you to Via Design. And uh, we will continue to uh, CBS, Institute of Marketing, and, and Ausetning. Mons, what do you say? <laughs> oh, we call it marketing in English. In English. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Mons Bia, and I uh, have the pleasure of being part of this uh, very exciting uh, project because I think what we are going to look at is actually how do we manifest brands digitally uh, how do we manifest the services that you are going to undertake towards your customers? And also, how do we look at, at the, the concept of branding? Because it has changed quite considerably over time. And what I'm going to do in just a minute is to go through uh, three phases of how the brand has been conceived. And one of the things that we are going to look at is actually what Wuna was speaking about, namely the fact that the brand may not exist as an objective unity, but it exists as what we call a social construction meaning that we agree on what the brand is. And that is a very different uh, managerial approach to how to manage brands. So um, without getting in too deep into the theory, uh, I think there's a question here of, of uh, who actually one owns the brand and who is actually leading where the brand is going. And I think that is a very, very exciting story to undertake. And I know that quite a few of you are working with these uh, concepts in, in actually getting out there and seeing what works and what doesn't work. So we are still in the experimental phase of um, understanding how to, to get around this, keeping some kind of influence over the brand, maybe not managing it anymore, maybe not controlling it anymore, but at least taking it into a specific direction. And I think this is where we'd like to, to go. So Wune, if you would give me the next slide. Thank you very much. We have traditionally been speaking that brand was uh, the visible part of it. And as you can see below the surface here, we speak about product services, events, sponsors, et cetera. Uh, and what has come over to, to be sort of an understanding of branding over the past few years is that the, uh, the water is uh, actually dropping. So more and more things become visible to the customers. Transparency is something which is really interesting. And uh, therefore we know that, that uh, one thing is what you say uh, about who you are and what your products can do and what your services can do but you're judged upon your behavior. 
So uh, I think this is where moral and ethics, this is where the way you treat customers, etc., actually comes into play and, and becomes quite interesting. And sometimes you think that you can keep things apart, but what happens out there is actually that customers and your constitu constitu constituency links things together and, and actually paint a bigger picture. You might note uh, that one of the larger insurance companies uh, recently got into trouble because they had paid out a, um, a refund for an old lady uh, for two specific designer chairs and she got two new ones. The, the first ones she had was stolen. Uh, then the chairs were recovered uh, in, by, uh, when police found them and they were sold on auction. And it's actually turned out that the two chairs that was stolen was the original stoles, uh, chairs designed and manufactured by the designer himself. So they had a huge value. What does the insurance company do with that money? They keep it. What does the public say about it? You should give it back to the old lady. Uh, meaning that all of a sudden these transactions that the company sees as being individual are actually linked together. And that's, that's actually a key point in these uh, few slides on, on branding. So Rune, if you would take me uh, one step further. Um, Sometimes we, we think that branding has a lot to do with quality. Uh, and I think that is, that is to, the, to your right here that you can say that the brand does something for me. I become more attractive, I become a stronger person or I become more interesting or I have a better smile or whatever. But the origin of branding is actually to your left. It was simply a stamp that was put on a cow because the cow was running around in the open prairie and nobody knew whose cow was whose. So we needed a stamp to say, this is my cow basically says nothing about quality, says nothing about behavior, says nothing about who we are, just that I own you, um, literally in this case, uh, for the cow. Um, so what we did actually a few years ago um, was to take the concept of branding uh, into the, how, how has academia treated it? And the next slide will show you how we actually got into that. So we found when we went down into the, to the theory that Branding has developed into three uh, different waves. Uh, the first and original one was actually that we spoke about that we can design the brand. And when I tell you that my brand has a red color that you should actually recognize like Ferrari. Um, well, then I say, whenever I see a red car, it's a Ferrari. Uh, as you all know, that's not the case, right? Ferraris, by the way, come in many other colors. Um, but the idea was that I can tell you who we are. So identity branding is what a lot of companies are still working with, namely who we are, what are our values and what we'd like to be seen as. Then the second wave comes in and says, hmm, maybe it's actually the customers who tell us who we are. And when you look at consumer-based personality and relationship branding, what all goes into here is actually the fact that the consumer gives value back to the brand. And one of the best examples we have is actually Harley Davidson, where you might say that Harley owners, Harley users are actually giving the brand a lot of essence and a lot of maturity, a lot of masculinity. Uh, some would also say poor quality, but, but uh, the, the point is really that it's the consumer that actually um, not legally owns the brand, but in essence tells everybody else what this brand is all about. So we're moving that the power has shifted from the company to the consumers. And the last one, which is really interesting uh, in the, what we call context-based branding is that you will see communities come up around you. I suspect that quite a few of you are working with communities around your products. Um, and we also see that communities is actually taking the consumer-based branding a step further where they actually tell you as a group what you can do and what you shouldn't do. Uh, so community is actually a really interesting uh, place where we see that, that consumers are acting together, not because they want to be a group, they just turn out to be a group. The cultural perspective is the last one of the three. And that's where we see that, that uh, what happens around us actually changes the context of the brand. Meaning that was what, one, the things that were right gradually, slowly changes. And this is where we need to keep a very keen eye on the consumer and the changes in consumption. Back to Rune's comment about consuming, which is really a key here. So you might say that uh, if you imagine, if you go 50 years back and you look at advertising for cigarettes, you would actually see people dressed as doctors recommending smoking. 
because it was not healthy for you, but you lost weight due to the fact that, that your metabolism would actually work faster when you smoke, right? So, so that would be unthinkable today. Uh, but it would be like if Shmilov actually did a, 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 an advertising saying you become a more funny person when you drink. Um, some might do, some get sleepy, etc. So, so it it's, may not work. But this, this is really the, the idea. And I have uh, three more slides. And if, if you'll give me the next one. As you can see here, the identity approach, which although it says 1980 to 95, it's still out there. So it's not that these perspectives actually replace each other, they coexist. And when you look at your own company, you might be looking at your marketing efforts and the way that you understand the brand as being, what is it that we do? How do we think that we can communicate and, and tell everybody else who we are? What do we sort of tap into and, and fit into? Um, and the identity approach is really a question of saying that we use the marketing mix. Some of you will probably be familiar with the four Ps, product, place, promotion, and, and packaging, pricing. Uh, and some might work with, with the seven Ps where we include the people, uh, meaning your employees, the processes, and, and what we call physical evidence, which actually is very much in line with what Stefan was speaking about, namely this idea of need for touch. Uh, so how do we get to that point? So we are, we're coming from a, a way where we, where, we, where we think that branding is something that we can tell you who we are. And then when we move to the next slide, you will see what happens is that we get into a dialogue. Thank you, Rune. Uh, where you can actually see that we are listening to how people are perceiving what we are saying. So the dialogue between the brand and the consumer customers is actually that we now see the brand as a person. You might uh, see that we have a number of service organizations that speak about themselves as being competent or fast or kind or curious or whatever. That's what we mean by personality. Uh, so the question is really, does that come across uh, to the to, to our customers? And do they think that your behavior is actually kind, fast, curious, or whatever? So you, all of a sudden, you're getting feedback from your customers saying, we don't buy into that. We don't see it. Um, and this is where we, it really becomes important to be able to listen very, very carefully to all uh, things that happen on social media. And if we move to the last one, uh, the uh, existing, that this is where we are today, um, where we basically see that if you look at the line, uh, the last line on the slide, consumers interpret and reinterpret and reinterpret. Uh, so the idea is that customers are now beginning to discuss who you are, how you behave, whether it's okay or not. Um, should you have done di things differently? Uh, and this is where we, we find the, the original idea of, of uh, this uh, concept of um, the polite way of call, is calling it media storms. Some would use another word instead of media. But uh, the perspective here is actually that, that all of a sudden you have to navigate in, a, uh, in, in, in an area where a lot of people, a lot of stakeholders have opinions about what you do. And if you're not ready to take them seriously and actually listen to that, and then understanding that this is also an opportunity to tap into what's going on in society, understand where we're moving, and actually understanding these waves in, in, in society. Uh, right now, we are under a, a very strong wave uh, in terms of ethical and moral uh, things that we need to take into account. Uh, so, so that takes up a lot of space. And, and, and of, of course, this is a question where you as managers in your organizations have to think about the way we behave, can that actually uh, withstand and, and be positive even if we take a closer look at things? Um, what happens if we become fully transparent? Should we transparent just internally or also externally? And I think this is where uh, a lot of the upcoming brands are actually taking transparency in the total supply chain as a way to actually differentiate themselves by saying, well, yes, of course we have to make money, but we don't hide the way we make money uh, as a way of, of, of looking into this. So all of this put into the touch points and into the customer journeys is something where the illustration that Rune had that you know it, it goes all over the place is something that we, uh, when we try to illustrate it, need to simplify, but we do understand that the complexity is out there. I think that was basically what I wanted to chip in with, uh, apart from the fact that this is the proof of the academic world. <laughs> um, this is one of the slides where I've put the most words in I've ever done. 
Um, so uh, this is just to show you that, that when you look at the seven approaches in total, there's a, a, a tendency to see that if you move from left to right, you can see that we move from we communicate to we listen to we interact. And sometimes, and that's, that's going to be my last statement, sometimes customers interact without our interference. So they actually speak about us while we're not being present. A little bit like being a family at, at a family party, but, but um, this, is, uh, this is what happens out there in real life. Thank you. Amazing moments and, and from moving from Rune talking about the hybrid and the touch points to your perspective on, on branding, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, oh my gosh, I wish we had so much more time. Luckily, uh, this is a teaser for a, a year project that you guys are doing together. And, and as a last uh, perspective, we're going to revisit with one of those in the family that we can't control and that goes ahead and, and do their own thing. So thank you, Moans and Sina. Will you then uh, take us through the retail sector and those shops that are the last, often the last point uh, communicating and interacting with the customers? Yes, thank you, Heidi. I will. Uh, I'm Sina. I'm a senior lecturer at the Via Design, and I am uh, teaching re de uh, retail design and business. Um, Rune, can I have the next slide, please? Yes. Well, this system uh, is a depiction of very much the same uh, system that, as, uh, as Moons was talking about uh, just before. It's a system that retailers operate, and most of you will probably intuitively recognize it. It can be derived both from academic literature, uh, but also from interviews with retailers. Historically, the focus was on the company and retailers' perspective, as uh, Moons just mentioned, um, it was equal to, to the branding approach uh, and all the things that are on the left-hand uh, side of, of this, uh, this mirror in between uh, the retailer and the customer. But a shift to focusing on the right-hand side uh, and uh, being customer-focused uh, and taking the customer as a starting point is very evident uh, in retail reality. What is also interesting is a technological development making the form of physical evidence uh, that Mo most mentioned uh, transform into a digital one, uh, thus merging what we used to consider divided into the digital and the physical aspects of retail uh, and merging it in what we call omnichannel. What is in between the retailer being digital or physical and uh, the customer is an interface depicted as this blue screen um, and in which uh, we find the touch point that Mons was talking about uh, that is in between uh, the, the two, the consumer and his culture and the, the company, the retailer, and both of them are trying to live in the same culture, you could say. Next slide, please. Talking about these touch points, we organize them in before, during, and after purchase. And when designing the customer journey, uh, companies and retailers organize the engaged touch points in successively in a customer journey performed by the ideal customer. The journey is thus a pragmatic concept, as is the ideal customer. It seems to work in practice. To the left hand side, um, oh, a new slide, please. To the left hand side, uh, you can see a drawing uh, indicating that a touch point multiply due to the developments both in devices, in media, and in channels uh, engaged. And the picture becomes increasingly complex, as both Rona and Mose already uh, implied. However, customers are seldom ideal, and their journeys as individual, as exemplified in the citation to the right. And it's describing a journey that the interviewer, the researcher uh, doing the interview at that point in time could simply not imagine. And I will quickly read it because often. If I see a top, it's a customer saying, if I see a top in a store on a hanger, it looks different to being on a person. And then often I have decided not to buy it. 
But when I come home and check it out quickly on the web shop, it looks different. And I think it might have been stupid not to buy it. It did not catch my attention at first in the store. And then the silhouette fit to the body it looks different and it's cooler. And then I go try it on. What seems to happen is making sense of the product. And thus you could say that the displays customers engage across realms have a certain job to get done. The job of providing the customer's understanding of the product. And if it doesn't matter, and it doesn't matter whether the product is tangible or not. The opportunity to capture challenges and possibilities that can lead to innovation relates to these individual journeys these stories become interesting. Next slide, please. For the purpose of capturing challenges and opportunities, um, we engaged the multiverse, as you can see it to the left, uh, it's a model, uh, and it consists of eight realms. I have uh, written in uh, the three of those that we are usually talking about in retail, reality, augmented reality, and virtuality. But there are, or eight all together that has been described. We also engage in a flat and um, in, in ontology, uh, equalizing physical and digital displays and focusing on the jobs to get done, as you can see depicted to the right, where we have uh, in the colored uh, columns, we have uh, the terminology used uh, today in retail. And in the center, we have a new technolo terminology describing the job, uh, the displays are doing, connecting the digital and the physical. New slide, please. What we do when we uh, try to engage uh, the multiverse uh, is, for example, as here, having students mapping examples of displays belonging to each of the realms in the multiverse. The question is, which is engaged in the interface of Danish lifestyle brands and retailers? Because these are international examples that have been gathered and placed into uh, this multiverse. Next slide, please. Also, to the left, we had students mapping out displays in physical or digital realms, organizing them according to the professional terminology that we know today, like shelves, tables, mannequins, photos, videos, and so on and so forth. And to the right, we then had them changing the map and moving the exact same displays into a typology focusing on the customer use of the displays or the job to be done, the terminology that was presented uh, in, in the slide before. Um, and thus resolving the physical uh, digital divide and getting, gaining a new understanding of other people for designing displays as part uh, of stores. Next slide, please. What we wonder uh, in this uh, project is how is the multiverse engaged in retail uh, designed customer journeys in lifestyle retail today? And which jobs are to be done uh, and which challenges and opportunities when to in innovation is revealed? For this a study across multiple cases to establish practices of today is interesting. And using this mapping as a starting point for further development, uh, we believe is relevant. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope you have questions or you have been become curious on uh, trying to work with some of these uh, methodologies and exploring the possibilities uh, for the customer journey. Thank you so much, Sina. And I think this was a, a great final pitch. It, you know, it really gives a picture of how complex the retail industry is right now. And it is probably one of those industries in the center of the or uh, the hurricane uh, of disruption right now because of digital tools and customer behavior and all the different elements you brought into play and, and the way we need to rethink about this actor in our supply chain. So it definitely left some curiosity and I know that the slides might be a little bit difficult to see. So I just want to raise the flag and see, you can revisit them after the seminar and, and see some of these methodologies and especially seen as the students, they are excellent and 
at giving us new ideas, I would say. Thank you so much, Sine, and uh, I hope everybody got a little bit of attention on those uh, different paths this project will take. And uh, Stefan, you will come back to later how you guys can be a case company and try some of these scenarios and, and be more exploratory in a way. But before we hear more about the project, I'm going to invite Morten to uh, unmute your microphone. I see you already did it. Excellent job, Morten. Um, I love the headline for your uh, conversation. And, and Morten, it's great to see you again. The blurred lines because this is truly what uh, what it is and, and what will become more of. You guys are, are breaching some of these blurred lines with a new technology. Welcome yes. to the digital <clears throat> stage, Morten. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me. Um, so yeah, so my name is Morten. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Slide. Um, and I think I will, we have a different approach to what we think retail should be. And I, I hope to provoke you a little bit uh, about some of the things that I will say today. So surely I'll just explain a little bit about what we do and then maybe take a, a more uh, practical example of what we believe retail and also um, how retail and, and fashion should be. And also um, if you're in design or anything else. Um, but yeah, surely so Slide is a company based out of Aarhus. We've raised 4.6 million US dollars in funding. And basically we want to reinvent the fashion industry and, and physical fashion industry. And what we believe is that uh, basically we believe that checkout and delivery is what's going to drive it for the next couple of years and also into the future. So really so many things are changing rapidly. And that's why I believe that physical stores and especially retailers and suppliers also needs to be very aware of customers right now, because I think everything starts with the customer. So when I founded Slide um, back in the day, I, I had a terrible experience in a Nike store in London. And it was a fantastic store that spent millions of dollars in like decorating the store, putting light up there and everything was great. The problem for me as a, as a young consumer was just that, yeah, it, it was looking really good, but I just wanted this t-shirt and I went down to the store to get it. But actually the, the pain points really came when I decided to purchase something. So I thought this needs to change because otherwise I'll just go to Amazon or Selena or something like that. And I think that future is coming really fast. Um, and that's kind of what we're trying to tap into. So really quickly, we, we built like a, a one platform that connects stores to, um, to, um, to, to an app that you can order from. And then uh, you can get it delivered to your house within three hours, no matter in the largest city in Denmark right now. And then we can check out in store. So our checkout in store is basically about replacing ordinary and old security tax. So if anyone has ever tried to steal a product in H&M or some other store, you'll know the, the alarm goes off and some people are laughing now. So I'll take that as a yes. Um, the alarm will go off, but basically the, the foundation of this product has been for years to make sure people are not stealing. So we said, hey, what if we build a product that people could actually interact with. So when you take your phone and put it onto the slide tag, you will get a product picture, video, price, all the information you need, then you just pay with one click and then the tag will click off. When you come home, you will be able to see all the inventory from the store you just visited. And then you can order anything you want from the store and have it delivered to your doorstep within three hours. Um, so we launched just before Corona, um, and now we are really starting to see things go upwards um, and glad that all the stores are open again. Um, I don't want to take, I, maybe I just want to show you the in-store concept so everyone knows how that works. So it's mounted, if you can see the video playing, I hope you can. Um, you can see that all the tags are replaced by the slide tag with the ba same basic functionality, which means that customers can then walk up to any given garment and then uh, take out the app, click the tag. And once they click the tag, it will basically display all the product information you need um, in your phone. Um, and then you pay using mobile pay or credit card or Apple pay. And then basically the tag will release itself. And then you are pretty much free to go. So it's more the understanding that my, cousin, my sister or myself, we don't go to stores because we want a great service. We go there because we want the product now. We want instant gratification. And that's what we get. And that's what we need to cater to. And then we, of course, get a lot of data about customers and what they interacted with. And I know this girl is interested in a blue dress or a pair of jeans. So I have all this data around her that I could utilize afterwards. Um, and then when she gets uh, home from the store, she can basically interact with all the products that she, uh, that she saw in the store. 
um, as we have live inventory from the tag itself. Um, she can order anything with Delivery Plus, which is a free service because the store, the product is often located within a few kilometers of where the customer lives. So it never ever makes sense to ship it from Poland or somewhere else like big platforms are doing. It's, it's completely insane to do it that way. Um, so when you come home, you'll have it delivered to your door and then you just have a great experience is what we usually see. Um, so first off, what we believe that we talk a lot about omnichannel and usually when I hear the word omnichannel, I don't even know what it means because there's so many different interpretations of what omnichannel is. So, so what we say is that omnichannel should really start with the customer. It should never be about like, I've even seen stores that do click and collect where they actually ship it from their, um, their warehouse to the store so the customer can go pick it up. That's really not any more convenient than getting shipped home. Omnichannel for us is really about how do you make it easier for the customer. It's not about how do you make it easier for your company. It's about how you make it easier for your customer. And that's what you need to tap into because customers are changing and they're changing fast. So I'm 25 years old. I had this experience in London for like two or three years ago and, and I'm frustrated. And then when I look back to when I was even younger, I was not frustrated to wait, waiting in the line. I was okay. I could wait five minutes in the line. But then suddenly I tried different things. You know, I used Uber from the airport. I used Airbnb when I was there. And then suddenly I was frustrated. I was extremely frustrated with having to wait in a line. And I asked myself, why are you frustrated? Because everything else has just gotten so much easier. And I think that's what you need to focus on is how do we make it easier for customers, whether it's offline or online. And I think those who manage to actually do that will be massive winners in the future. So what we think is also with customers is that the number one thing that like by far, if you ask me that will drive customers to your store or to your online shop or to whatever you're selling in the future is if you're the best at the, um, at the, at the service afterwards. Um, and that that's basically driven by convenience because convenience is basically time and how we look at it. So I usually like rich people always say you cannot buy more time. And I say, it's ridiculous. You can definitely buy more time. I buy time every single day when I use vault to order my food. I, I, I buy time when I use nimni.com. I used to, I, I buy time all the time. And I think the people and the retailers who actually will understand that selling a product is one thing, but if you can sell something else, time, for example, then you have a winning cocktail because there's no way to compete with that. And that's kind of what we're saying is like, why would anyone ever order on Salendo if you can have the same product in slide and have it delivered within three hours free of charge? And we can make it work. Like the unit economics are there to actually support it. But I think that's kind of the evolution we will see. And we've seen it already in like Germany, like 10 minute delivery of groceries is a thing that's coming now. And these companies are getting funding like, and like $50 million, like seed rounds and stuff like that. So the convenience level is what's going to win the customer in the future. And I think we've all tried to use some of these things, like, as I said, Vault, you know, using scan and go in stores. These, these things are taking time to adapt. And those who started like two or three years ago are in a good position now. But the next three years is really when it will take off. And that, I think that's really when you need to start focusing on how do we incorporate this into whatever industry we are in or whatever vertical we are in the, in the journey of selling a product. Um, so, so overall, we believe that everything should start with the customers. We do not build anything in here without asking ourselves the simple question, will this make it easier for the customer? And if it's a yes, we build it. If it's a no, we don't even, we don't even think about it. So everything needs to be more convenient. And that's, I think that's the driving force in the winning retail uh, companies of the future. Um, and then I, I often look at, at retail and I look at fashion and like, why, why are these guys not getting it? Like you are sitting on the gold mine of the future. You literally have infrastructures to, to support what Amazon wants, right? So Amazon have almost a warehouse in every single state in the US. They could easily supply the whole U.S. with like four or five warehouses. But what they know is happening is that when Walmart suddenly discovered that they have a warehouse in every single city in the U.S., they will be able to deliver faster and they have the same products. So Amazon is really scared that suddenly they will, the, 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 they will tip and they will be the underdog in retail. And that's why they're investing so heavily in it. 
And then when we look across the world, there's tons of small retailers with tons of infrastructure, but they haven't figured out how to use it. And if they figured out to use it, there wouldn't be a Salendo in five or 10 years. There would never be because the customer would just have a better experience at the other, at the other platform. Um, so I think the problem and what needs to be focused on is really like, how do we actually enable convenience? And if you're a small retailer or a large retailer, what you need to do is like, how do I get this product faster to the customer? Because if you are faster than your competitor, they will buy with you. If you are, have a better in-store service than your competitor, they will come to you. You need to have the products, you need to have the selection, everything else, but it all is centered around the customer. Um, so what we believe is that basically in, in two or three years, you will be able to have everything. And I'm talking like groceries, I'm talking like uh, building materials, I'm talking everything. I believe like you can have it delivered to your doorstep within a few hours because it's so close nearby and the gig economy is growing fast and like there's money in it. So it's really about winning the customer and then getting the supply somewhere. Um, and then we also believe that you can walk into any store and then you can walk out again. So I believe that you need to touch products and you, you need to feel products, but I also believe that you as a customer are really, you know everything about the product you wanna purchase. So you don't necessarily need someone to tell you that. When my dad goes shopping, he of course needs someone to tell him that this suit looks good or that this shirt looks good. That's why he's buying it. But my sister, there's no way she will walk into an H&M store and a store associate can sell her extra pair of socks. It's never going to happen. The best customer experience for her in that store is the less contact she has with anyone and that she can listen to Beyonce or whatever she wants and just be herself. It's the best experience she can have. And online, if they actually enable her to get her products faster than anyone else, then why would she ever go anywhere else? And I think that's the, that's the main thing that, that we really think about and where we see things are going. And then what we live by here is that, and I think that's really important for retail also is that it's not a question if this is going to happen. It's a question when, and that is kind of with everything in the world. It's not a question if we get to Mars, it's a question when we get to Mars. It's not a question if we will ever have all electric cars, it's a question uh, when. And I think that's a really good thing to have in mind. So whenever you see new technology come around and say, no, that's never going to happen. Well, it is going to happen. Um, it's just a question when. Um, so I think that's something that should really be considered and then focus on customer convenience and focus on customer pain points and not the lighters. So I see people bringing like coffee machines into like 20,000 crown coffee machines into their shops and say, now we have a great retail experience. Yes, but customers are not coming for the coffee. They're coming for the product. And if someone else is better at giving them it to them faster or better, they will go there. Um, so I think it's really about being adaptive and really focusing on customers in, in the long run. Um, yeah, so that was just a short, uh, short um, presentation of, of what we believe is, is the future of, of retail. Thank you so much, uh, Morten. There's a few uh, reflection and ideas on uh, in the chat that you can revisit and maybe uh, shoot a comment at. Um, we're going to move ahead in the program, but Morten, I appreciate you giving a heads up on um, on the work that you're doing, I, uh, I'm probably a big fan of Slide and I find it extremely convenient. So I've used it several times, but I, you know, we've always hear the, the heads up on putting the customer in the center of evolution, of development, of business development. Um, but I love the, the example you're putting forward and, and showing how you have actually done it. So thank you for that. Um, Rune or Stefan, do you want to grab it? I'll, I'll do that, uh, Heidi. Perfect. And uh, first of all, thank you, Morten, for a, a fascinating go through of how you do it. Uh, lots of uh, food for thought there. Uh, and also, perhaps in another setting, so I could uh, be intrigued to provoke you back, <laughs> in a sense. Um, but uh, very fascinating. Uh, in, maybe we can get a chance to do that in this track. Uh, I don't know, but I'll just uh, conclude with a few words on how, on, on what's next, basically. So we envision that you can participate in one of two ways. Uh, you can choose A or B. We are looking for use case companies that will work with us more intensively, expect the time about 10 hours during April, May, June. And then of course, 
you're also free to follow us and continuously be invited to our simulation activities, such as this webinar, which was, as we started out, not solution-based, but more inspirational. Uh, and we also have some, um, some, some other output uh, formats that you can uh, get into. But if you choose A and why you should choose A, uh, we envision this, uh, this process as we go forward. But the, the important point is, of course, the why. And that is, as we see it, to take an active part in documenting practices and best practices, maybe bad practices. And from that departure, explore and envision emerging next practices. Get to an articulate and explore own way of working with this issue. Maybe uh, provoke us and say you're completely wrong here. Uh, seeing Rune and Mons and, and Stephen, we want to, uh, to course correct it this way and we can provoke you back. Uh, we can learn, you can learn from your peers as we have several cases that we work together as this timeline also illustrate. We'll do some interviewing and workshop with you individually and then in joint sessions. Uh, and then we will end up with a kind of report mapping and dissemination uh, seminar here. So the, 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 the point is that we will present a map of what is going on and then you will work with us to identify where on the map you are and where perhaps you are not, where do you want to be, where in this whole entanglement are you stuck or maybe not stuck. Um, so this is basically uh, our, um, our process here. I think maybe uh, Heidi, you have also put it in the chat. I don't know, but uh, otherwise we'll put the link in the chat and we will also do a follow-up uh, mail with it. But we have this uh, link here that we would love you to go to and visit, answer the questions. And then basically as this um, quote, quote here says, which could be kind of the, the end words from us is that in pursuit of knowledge, every day something is acquired and in pursuit of wisdom, every day something is dropped. Some clever words here that we like to tap into. So we know that you know knowledge is about the accumulation of facts, information, and knowing about something that we learn through experience, studies, observation, and experiences. But then wisdom is the ability to distinguish and judge when, how, and which aspects of knowledge that is workable in life or in practice. And it is really that translation that we in this track is um, trying to uh, tap into uh, so that we can, can learn from each other. I think that is uh, the final words from me. I don't know if you want to add anything, Heidi, or perhaps you, Stefan. Uh, otherwise, I think it's been, um, I hope you have enjoyed the, um, the different presentations. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rune. Stefan, uh, if you want to give a shout out, I'll uh, round it off. I can just say that, uh, I mean, don't, don't miss this uh, opportunity. Uh, you will interact with some very clever, very smart people and hear more about this and uh, learn from, uh, from some of the world leading researchers in the area, but also learn from each other. Um, and eventually there is a, a flip side that maybe we should mention that uh, once we get into exploring the, the next practices, we will certainly base what you have and invite you to be part of that journey as well, to work with us, not only to document what you do, but also how to move that forward. And uh, for clarification, right, this link is a sign up for the, uh, I mean, the presentation and track you heard today. We're going to continue um, with two more sessions where I mean, you're equally welcome to join all of them, right? Um, so, but if you're interested in this aspect, I don't think it's too much work, work but it's actually a great um, introspective learning activities to do this. So, and uh, that's just where I wanted to support it, Stefan. Uh, today you heard about the digital customer journey, the touch points. So for this project, we have a focus of three tracks. So if you're a company that's curious about what you heard today, you can join that track, but you would have the same opportunity. Maybe you can uh, team up and, and have different uh, employees sign up on the different tracks, but we will revisit again next Thursday, talking about digital uh, commerce in the B2B industry. And we will also revisit another Thursday, uh, talking about the need for touch when you're working with digitalization in the design industry. 
As a final quote, the last 30 seconds, if you had a phone call, if you had to run to the bathroom, if you got lost in an email and forgot to listen in, today was the focus on the digital customer journey and the touch points working specifically in the design industry. And we started out revisiting with Via Design and Rune talking about the hybrid touch points and the paradox in when we're innovating and testing and how we how frustrating that could be, but also trying still to exploit all the things that we still have possible in the customer journey. We listened in on Mons Bia from CBS talking about this ice mountain and how transparency is moving closer and closer and you're being judged as a brand on what you do and not only what you say. So how do you move your brand from this control perspective into a more culture and navigating in that culture? And then listening to Sina also from Via Design talking about how complex the retail industry is right now and how we get them to move forward and think in a new way. And slide more than you were ex Extremely good uh, case showing these blurred lines and how we can utilize it and actually not only sell a good design product, but maybe in the future sell more time to the customer as well. So thank you everybody for listening in. We will forward the presentation and the slides, but we hope to see a lot of you companies wanting to interact with this project going forward. Thank you for uh, everybody that wanted to participate today. You will get a evaluation and all the information, but also a invitation to the following Thursdays where we will dig deeper in the following tracks. Thank you everybody, have a great day.